by my colleague, uh, Professor Ferrari. Uh, what I'll try to do is to go through four of them, namely um, what is about compliance that you already heard, and I'll just touch it from a different angle. Uh, then how to use biochemical markers in your future handling of patients. And uh, for orthopedic uh, surgeons, the big problem, do bisphosphonates actually affect fracture healing? And finally, uh, the future, namely uh, possible combination therapies between bone forming anabolic agents and uh, anti-resorptive agents. First, the uh, compliance. You already heard from my predecessor on this podium that uh, there is bad compliance with osteoporosis drugs. It's not only with osteoporosis drug. Antihypertensive drug, uh, type 2 diabetic drugs all have a similar pattern. After a year, only half of the patients take them, and you saw the long-term consequences uh, of this uh, lack of compliance. I think we have a, a solution, uh, namely... Um, to, to use more infrequent uh, administration. And this is to overcome this issue uh, that has been highlighted in a paper by Ethel Cyrus uh, a couple of years ago, that you actually need quite a substantial uh, uh, compliance, uh, or if you have 80%, uh, you will get uh, about half the optimal effect of your osteoporosis drug compared to 100% compliance. If you're down to 50%, which you saw the majority of patients will be, uh, then actually you have virtually no effect of your anti osteoporotic drug. So I think it's very important to detect those non-compliant patients, and I'll come back to that later in my talk. However, with infrequent administration, it seems that you can overcome some of these problems. These are data from uh, comparing one, two, and three-year results from different osteoporosis trials. You see the uh, solidronic acid trial on the left. Uh, then you have recitinate, uh, alendinate, and ibandinate. And what is really uh, 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 quite... Uh, uh, Difficult, different is the difference between two and three year results where we with the IV once yearly uh, by bisphosphonate administration get the similar antifractive efficacy uh, and it's also pretty similar in the denosumab uh, data you just saw. However, if you look at the all therapies like recitinate or alendinate or ibandinate, you lose efficacy over time, uh, probably not because the drugs are bad, but because even in clinical trials from which these results uh, uh, come, you have lack of compliance when you go to three years, patients stop uh, taking their uh, drugs even in clinical trials and as you saw in real life, it's even worse. Now, turning to biochemical markers, I think we've undergone a great development, uh, having developed very specific biochemical markers, especially the markers that uh, measure collagen, bone collagen uh, turnover. And uh, if we look at biochemical markers, we have known for some time that you get an increase in turnover as measured by chemical markers, uh, both formative and resorption markers between premenopausal women, the blue bars, and then postmenopausal women, the white and green bars. And this has been associated with an increase in fracture risk. These are data from the placebo group of the solidronic acid trial, where you see that patients, and here we have measured the P1 and P levels, the most specific bone formation marker we have available these days that measures collagen type 2 uh, uh, turnover. You see that a high level of uh, P1 and P is associated with a high uh, risk of fracture, 13.7%, compared to a low level of uh, P1 and P having a fracture risk of around 5 to 6%. Here again highlighting that you can consider a high turnover state as reflected in a high bone marker level as an independent risk factor of, fra uh, uh, of fracture compared to the other risk factors you heard in the uh, previous talk. Uh, there has been some discussion on uh, what is the optimal reduction of bone turnover. Now we know that high bone turnover is ba bad. How much should we reduce bone turnover to get optimal uh, antifractive efficacy? And that was uh, initiated by this study by Richard Easel based on the recitinate data, showing that if you l went below a 40% change in NTX, which is one of the collagen resorption markers, then you did not really get further reduction of fractures as shown here on the y-axis. So once you reached a 40% reduction, you did not really have uh, much extra uh, benefit by reducing turnover further. That was, however, uh, contradicted by uh, data from the Alendonate FIT trial, where there was a continuous uh, better antifractive efficacy fractures here, change in bone alkaline phosphatase as a formative marker here, and the more you reduced it, the better. This was especially poignant when you looked at non-spine fractures. As shown here, 
if you had less than a 30% reduction of, uh, of uh, alkaline phosphatase, you did not have significant reduction of non-spine fractures compared to placebo. However, in the group that had a higher reduction in uh, bone markers, you had a significant reduction. So it seemed that in order to get good efficacy on non-spine fractures, uh, you needed more reduction. Recently, we have uh, even more uh, significant results where compliance issues are actually ruled out, namely the uh, results from the IV bisphosphonate trials. This shows you the bone marker uh, changes. Here it's beta CTX, one of the other collagen-related uh, resorption markers, where you have the premenopausal range in green, placebo group in white, and the uh, treated group in orange. And you see that after one infusion of uh, solidronic acid here at the start, you get a pronounced reduction down to the lower level of premenopausal range, and you keep it down there for the whole three years. Using this uh, data, it was shown that for uh, uh, vertebral fractures, the more you reduce uh, the uh, uh, marker here again, P1 and P, the more you reduce fractures. And it's even more prominent when you look at non vertebral fractures, again, a steep decline, the more reduced uh, P1 and P, the better antifractor efficacy. So this data would suggest, together with the alendronate data, that it is good to have a, a, a good uh, suppression of bone turnover, especially for non vertebral fractures. But I will uh, admit that there may be subtle differences between the different bisphosphonates which you heard about that may uh, uh, have a slight offsetting effect on this conclusion. But this is just to show that by using changes in bone marker levels, here all clinical fractures, non vertebral and vertebral fractures, here's the hazard ratio. You see that you have for vertebral fractures, for example, a 40% reduction for each standard deviation that the bone marker level reduces. And it's actually more predictive than, for example, BMD after three years in this trial, where you only have a 30% reduction for each increase, each standard deviation increase in BMD. So bone markers, if the patients take the drugs, uh, are actually good uh, predictors of antifractor efficacy with antiresorptive drugs. And uh, another issue that I think we have uh, also gotten further uh, information on are with the recent trials. Here you see the reduction of hip fractures with solidronic acid of 40%, 77% of clinical vertebral painful fractures, and the 25% reduction of non-vertebral fractures. And this is with a drug that creates a 70% reduction of bone turnover. As you heard from uh, Serge Ferrari, uh, there is a new drug that gives you more than a 90% reduction of turnover, namely denosumab, the monoclonal antibody. And with this drug, virtually you've got overlapping uh, fracture reductions. When you compare the reductions with 70% compared to over 90% with denosumab, you have virtually superimposable antifractor results with this drug. This has led some people to conclude that uh, we have actually maxed out on antiresorptive drugs. We can probably not do much better than with these two drugs in uh, the prevention of fractures with antiresorptive drugs. How can you use bone markers as monitoring tools? There was a lot of disappointment when we started to use them with the all bisphosphonates because we saw highly variable uh, results and also a lot of day-to-day -day variation. But with uh, IV bisphosphonates, I think we have had the experience that they are very predictive. Here you see uh, changes uh, in uh, uh, the, the fraction of patients with a decrease in bone markers in the placebo groups here and the treatment groups. And if you look at the treatment groups, then you see a very high response rate. About 90 to 97 percent show a response already after six months in bone markers. So if you know that the patient gets a drug, virtually everybody will show a reduction uh, in bone markers here at CTX. And if you look at the least significant change, which we would call significant, more than 60% for beta-CTX, actually 73% will show a significant result. So it seems that if the patient gets the drug, these markers are actually quite good tools for monitoring. And that has led us to start to use them uh, to identify the risk patients that do not take their oral bisphosphonates, especially with oral bisphosphonates and other oral drugs. The compliance is the biggest problem, as you heard, and you can actually use to, uh, these markers measured at three or six months to detect which patients don't take the drugs reasonably well or don't take the drug at all, and then maybe change, a different, uh, change to a different therapeutic option. Finally, I want to uh, deal with uh, two uh, uh, other issues, namely combination therapy with uh, anabolics and antiresorptives. 
This is the future, I think, once we get cheaper anabolics than we have now. But we already have some experience. This is, of course, the PTH data. Uh, actually, we have a drug in osteoporosis, which no other uh, therapeutic area has, namely a drug that is able to rejuvenate bone. Here you see the change in the same individual before and after 21 months of uh, 20, PTH 1 to 34 therapy, where you actually get a reconnecting of trabeculae and actually a change in trabecular bone architecture and cortical thickness that you would see in a younger individual. Now, as doctors, of course, we always want to combine drugs, and there are of three different scenarios, I think, that you can use. You can give the anti-resorptive before the anabolic, the anabolic before the anti-resorptive, or you can give them two together. And I'll show you some exam examples of that. First, anti-resorptive before anabolic. That was the first option that was tried in several clinical trials, and here exemplified with alendronate before PTH. The results were quite disappointing. You're all familiar with this data by Finkelstein and also similar data from Dennis Black showing that this is a change in BMD with alendronate alone, parathyroid hormone, and then combination alendronate parathyroid hormone. What was seen was that the combination gave you a poorer BMD response than PTH alone. And if you looked at the biochemical markers, then you saw that also the change in P1NP, which or alkaline phosphatate, which are good uh, markers of bone formation, you saw that uh, the combination therapy had an inferior response compared to PTH alone. Now, anabolic together with anti-resorptive at once has also been tried. PTH again, and then one infusion of solidronic acid right at the start of initiation of PTH therapy. What is seen there is actually a different response. Here you actually get a better BMD response with the combination group compared to PTH alone, and much better than solidronic acid alone. So completely different from what was seen with alendronate. And also in the hip you see the same, a much better response. The reason for that is probably the following. With uh, solidronic acid, you do not get an, a, a blunting of osteoblastic uh, activity for very long. Here you see uh, beta-CTX and more importantly P1 and P as a mark of bone formation. And you see there's just a short decrease, then P1 and P starts to go up again and reaches the PTH alone at one year. This is completely different from what is seen with alendronate, where you have a continued suppression of P1 and P and alkaline phosphatase. Uh, as shown here. So probably the IV bisphosphonate uh, actually can be used in a combination with uh, PTH without uh, significant blunting of the uh, effect. Why is that? We think that it is because when you administer bisphosphonate frequently, some of the bisphosphonate gets into the osteoblast and prevents this transformation that you see uh, in PTH from a lining cell to a more active osteoblast. The cytoskeletal response that's needed for that is inhibited if you get too much bisphosphonate inside the cell. However, um, what uh, you get with IV bisphosphonates is only one serum peak every year where the bisphosphonate can get into osteoblasts, and therefore you get less inhibition of this transformation. Finally, you can look at anabolic followed by anti-resorptive. Personally, I think that is the most likely scenario in the future, the reason being that, uh, for example, PTH versus solidronic acid. The reason being that once you stop PTH, here you see the change in BMD with PTH, once you stop and give no drug after stopping, you get a loss of the effect on the skeleton, a loss of BMD. However, several studies have shown that if you give HRT or bisphosphonates, you keep the bone mass, actually increase it slightly further. So you don't get the bone loss that you would get if you didn't treat the patient. So I think the from this, you can deduct that you need to treat your patients with some kind of anti-resorptive drug after you have treated them with PTH. And there are data already showing that you get the same effect with soldronic acid also. I'll just show you a personal example from my clinic. Here's a 68-year-old uh, uh, male with very severe osteoporosis, multiple spine fractures, and actually respiratory problems due to it. He was put on PTH for one and a half year, which was the, uh, uh, the duration permitted in Europe at that time. Now it's two years. And you see a nice increase in BMD uh, in, until here, where we had reached 18 months, around 13%. And then he was given solidronic acid and subsequently further increased his BMD. So I think this is a way in the future to actually get a very nice response uh, uh, in the skeleton once you combine the two uh, drugs. 
Finally, uh, for orthopedic surgeons, every time I give talks on bisphosphonates to orthopedic communities, the pr question number one is, can we give bisphosphonates? Doesn't it interfere with fracture healing? I don't understand where it comes from. It may come from the very early data on uh, uh, see the, the early bisphosphonates, etitonate, where there were some problems in animal experiments. However, I would submit that with the newer bisphosphonates, we don't have this problem. Uh, we have plenty of animal studies here. It's one with soldronic acid, but the same has been done with alendronate also, that you do not get impairment of fracture healing. What you get is delayed resorption of the fracture callus. But actually, that's not bad. Because as shown here, this is a control uh, peak load on biomechanical testing, and then the different treatments uh, at, at, uh, exactly during the fracture repair, one and two weeks later, you get actually an improved biomechanical competence of the fracture site compared to the control site. Uh, again, you do not see any impairment of fracture healing with these drugs. And actually, we have even better data now namely from the hip fracture study with solidronic acid where there was a targeted assessment of bone fracture healing. What, uh, here you see the patients uh, uh, getting infusions less than two weeks after fracture repair up to uh, uh, 12 weeks after fracture repair. So here you had patients that got solidronic acid infusions, very high concentrations of an IV bisphosphonate at different time points during the fracture healing process after hip fracture repair. And you see that uh, you got a, after two weeks, you got a, a significant reduction of fractures, uh, uh, clinical fractures in these patients. And also fracture healing was assessed. And there you see, even if the patients get it early, where it would be suspected to interfere the most with fracture healing, there are no more unions in the solidronic acid group compared to placebo. Actually, placebo has slightly more, but not significant. And even further on, no significant difference in fracture non-unions at the hip. But irrespective of when you give the drug, you do not get uh, adverse effects on the fracture healing. And that has been shown also with all bisphosphonates. So to me, it's a non-issue with fracture healing problems uh, with these drugs. Okay. So finally, I want to conclude my talk. And uh, I hope I've been able to show you that uh, we have compliance problems with all therapies. We need to detect the patients early in order to change uh, course of treatment, and you can do that with biochemical markers. They are not only useful for assessing baseline risk, where high turnover is a risk factor, but also for early monitoring to detect the non-complying patients. And uh, I also hope I've been able to convince you that bisphosphonates do not impair fracture healing, whether you give them early in the fracture healing process or late in the fracture healing process. And finally, I think we are entering a new era where we'll use combination therapies with anabolics and uh, anti-resorptive drugs more. Uh, and uh, there it seems that the IV administration of bisphosphonates is better than the frequent oral administration with the oral compounds. Thank you very much.